Among the authors of romantic literature, none is more famous than Sir Walter Scott. His highly idealized and imaginative writings earned for him the name The Great Romantic. One of the most widely read of his poems is The Lady of the Lake, an exciting story of 16th century Scotland. To enjoy the poem fully, we should keep in mind the background of the story, the Scottish people and places which the author describes so vividly. Sir Walter lived at Abbotsford, his beautiful home which can still be seen in the wooded hills of Selkirk County, Scotland. It is in the border country between England and Scotland. A little farther north is Edinburgh, the royal heart of Scotland. And north of that, in the highland country, is the Trossachs, the setting of the Lady of the Lake. At Abbotsford, Sir Walter lived for 20 years, writing novels and poems about Scottish characters and places. His love of history, of the ideals of chivalry and knighthood, these are a part of his home, which looks like a feudal manor house of old. Here in his library, the master of romantic literature recreated the Scottish heroes and the exciting episodes we read about. Sir Walter, sometimes called the Lord of Abbotsford, could look up from his writing to gaze out over the historic countryside. He was fond, too, of walking here in his garden. From Abbotsford, he could see the beautiful Eildon Hills, another one of his favorite haunts. Scott often said, I can stand on the Eildon Hill and point out 43 places famous in war and verse. From this border region, Scott drew much of his inspiration. The city of Edinburgh, where Scott also lived, was another source of historic material. Dominating the city is the ancient castle on Castle Rock. Edinburgh Castle was a place of refuge for Scotland's rulers in the early days of the wars with England, wars that provided a stirring theme for literature. Romance and history live again at Holyrood House, home of Scotland's royalty. This part of the palace was built by James V, the same king we meet in The Lady of the Lake. In the poem, we also read of Sir Roderick Dew and how, in Holyrood, a knight he slew. Scott, who lived in this house in Edinburgh, was familiar with the turbulent history of the royal city. He was equally familiar with the Trussex region in the Highlands. And it is here, in this wild and picturesque country, that most of the action of the Lady of the Lake is staged. Here we can still see every lake or loch and every mountain or ben described in the poem. Today, the high ridge of Ben Leedy stands as it did when the stag hunters thundered past it. Nearby is beautiful Loch Benahar, where the hunters, with clanging hoof and horn, swept on in the chase. The startled stag, you remember, stretching forward free and far, sought the wild heath of Uamvar. Here on the heath of Uamvar, the noble stag was pausing now upon the mountain's southern brow. In reading the poem aloud, as Sir Walter himself liked to do, we sense the strong rhythm that gives movement to the story. As we follow the course of the hunt, we see next the copsewood gray that waved and wept on Loch Cray and mingled with the pine trees blue on the bold cliffs of Benvenue. Near Benvenue, on the north, is Ben Ann. Ben Ann and Benvenue are the two mountains that form the pass, the deep wild nook that is called the Trussocks. And just beyond lies the lake for which the poem is named, Loch Catron. We see it just as the stag hunter Fitz James saw it. In all her length far winding lay, with promontory, creek, and bay. Seeing the rugged beauty of the Trussocks, as Fitzjames first saw it, we can understand why, raptured and amazed, he cried, what a scene we're here. If we look closer, we can find details of the landscape. Here is the purple heather described in the poem, and here the blue harebell, while anchored in the rifted rock is the blue pine. Fitzjames first saw the Lady of the Lake, Ellen Douglas, as she stood in her boat 
near the shore. The beautiful Ellen, you remember, invited Fitzjames to share the hospitality of the Douglas Lodge on Ellen's Isle. This is the island where Ellen's father met Malcolm Graham and Roderick Dew. Perhaps it was in this very sylvan bower on the island that young Malcolm and grim Sir Roderick almost came to blows over fair Ellen. Here too on the island, Sir Roderick received the news that King James had laid waste the border country and was coming north. Quickly, Roderick sent the traditional signal to gather the clan. This modern messenger, in historic costume, shows how the burning cross might have been carried. The fiery cross should circle o'er dale, glen, and valley, down and moor. We read how every hut and hamlet rose in arms, and as the men responded to the summons, the fishermen forsook the strand. The mower, blithe, left in the half-cut swath his scythe. The herds without a keeper strayed, and the plough was in mid-furrow stayed. Instant the time, Sir Roderick had said, the muster place be Lanrick Mead. On the mead, or meadow, Roderick's clan gathered. Today, Scottish clans still gather on certain occasions, not to make war, but to enjoy their traditional games and dances. Proud of the historic names they bear, these men still keep alive the romantic spirit of the clans to which they belong. Each man, according to the poem, was strongly bound to his leader, owning no tie but to his clan, no oath but by his chieftain's hand. Something of this deep sense of loyalty still keeps the clans together. Just as the clans in the poem carried their ancient crests, so today, the clans are still identified by their banners. The clans are also distinguished by the colors and patterns of their tartans. Remember Sir Roderick's waving of his tartans broad and Malcolm Graham's tartan hose? Tartan patterns have remained unchanged and are still called by their famous clan names. The weapons we read about in the poem are the heavy broadsword that Sir Roderick carried the short winyard that Fitzjames used, the heavy battle axe that hung with the hunting spear in the Douglas Lodge, and the targe or shield that hung in Duncan's Hall. The tasseled horn or bugle was used both in hunting and in war. The battle in the poem took place here in the rude Trussock's dread defile. The martial din of Roderick's warriors and King James' men echoed against Grey Benvenue. Here at Coelantogo Ford, Roderick Dew and the King, you remember, fought hand to hand. For this is Coelantogo Ford, and thou must keep thee with thy sword. Roderick's challenge ended with victory for the King. Here near Loch Venahar, the Highland chief, Roderick, received his mortal wound. And then the poem moves to its conclusion at Stirling Castle. Bulwark of the North, Grey Stirling with her towers and town. To this famous royal stronghold, the king returned to take part in the games and tournament. Within the castle dungeon, Roderick Dew, a prisoner, died as he listened to the account of the Trussocks battle. And it was within Stirling Castle too that fair Ellen and young Malcolm were reunited. Here they received a blessing from the king, the same Fitzjames they had met in the Highlands. From Stirling's walls, we can look north to the Trussocks. The stirring events, the Highland chieftains, the deeds of love and war that Scott retold, all these have passed away. But in knowing this background of the story, we can still bring to life the poem we read. Harp of the North, Farewell. The hills grow dark. On purple peaks, a deeper shade descending. And now the mountain breezes scarcely bring a wandering witch note of the distant spell. And now, tis silent all.